Dan Paraka. I'm the coordinator for the annual country study program. Um, you received the flyer for the film festival next week, so every night next week we'll be showing a different Russian film on campus. Um, four nights will be in the Austin Residence Complex, and then on Wednesday night we'll be here in this building. Um, and we've got uh, popcorn and soda as well to go with the movie, and we've got different um, uh, faculty who, who, are, who are there to introduce the films and answer any questions after the films. Um, we did this in the fall. We have a series in the fall with mostly older films in the fall. And then I think we have some more of the more, uh, new releases this semester. So I hope you'll consider joining us for, for those uh, events. Uh, the lecture series will continue every Thursday of this semester, right here, same time, same room. And uh, we have a big symposium March 16th and 17th. Um, It'll be a full day here on the 16th, and then a half day at Georgia Tech on the 17th with a lot of uh, leading scholars from around the country. And also, I expect that we'll have about 10 people coming from Russia, uh, including a, a delegation of faculty and students from the GIMO, um, which is a, um, a leading uh, university for diplomats in, in Russia. Um, so we're very excited about, about that program, and that's free and open to all students and faculty to attend individual sessions. If you want to attend the full um, symposium with all the meals, uh, there's a registration fee. So uh, to get to today's uh, event and speaker, we're really honored to have uh, Henry Hale here with us. He's Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University um, and author of Patronal Politics, Eur Eurasian Regime Dynamics in Comparative Perspective. Um, he specializes on political regimes, ethnic politics, and post-Soviet politics. And his previous work has won two awards from the American Political Science Association, including one for his book, why Not Parties in Russia, um, which was published uh, by Cambridge in 2006. Um, from 2009 to 2012, he was director of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at uh, George Washington um, University. And he's currently um, the editorial board chair of, uh, I may mispronounce it, Democratizatia, the Journal of Post-Soviet Democratization. So again, we're really honored, Henry, to have you participate. He flew in, arrived like an hour ago, and after his talk, he's heading to California. Uh, so again, we're really lucky to have you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Dan, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think this is a terrific tradition that the university has, sort of devoting a whole year to just a really wide-ranging um, scope of topics related to a country or a region. Um, so I've been getting the emails related to Russia, and wow, I kind of wish I was here. Uh, this is fascinating. So um, what I'm going to talk about a bit today is uh, Russia's domestic politics. Um, and in that context, I want to focus on one particular question, um, which I think will give an angle into how Russia's political system works. Um, and if I don't cover the particular aspect of Russia's domestic politics that you're interested in, I'm happy to uh, address that or any related topic in the question and answer. Um, and so uh, when we read media about Russia's domestic politics, I mean, we hear a number of things. Um, sometimes we hear reference to uh, Putin's uh, high levels of popularity, how popular this guy is, how he has all this support. Um, but at the same time, we often read a lot uh, of reports about how, well, this is really just a dictatorship. Um, you know, it's just full of corruption, um, it manipulates the whole system. Um, so there's kind of a puzzle there in the sense of, uh, you know, why does it matter so much whether Putin is popular? Is he really popular, um, you know, if Russia is a dictatorship? And if it is um, a dictatorship of some kind, then, you know, what role exactly does domestic politics um, play? Um, and so I think uh, opinion polls in Russia uh, are a useful tool for helping us to get at some of these things. So 
um, that get at this question. So what I'll do is talk a bit about Russia's political system, um, the role of public opinion in it, um, then look at how uh, Putin has generated public support in Russia and kind of what this is based on, um, focusing in particular on the uh, episode whereby Russia annexed uh, Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula in 2014 and Putin's popularity uh, soared immediately by about 20 percentage points, depending on which metrics you use. Um, and that still uh, appears to have lasted uh, through today. I mean, right now, um, I mean, I, I didn't look just today, but um, you know, the last polls I saw, Putin still had roughly 80, over 80% 80 uh, approval ratings. Um, and these are fairly reliable polls, but again, that's something that we can, we, we'll talk about. Um, so I think that uh, part of the argument I would make is that uh, even though Russia is not a democracy, it's not a clear cut case of dictatorship either. Um, and in fact, public opinion does matter in this system. And it matters in particular for helping maintain the stability of the, of the regime, of Putin's system. Um, and all, but not in the sense of just allowing him to win free and fair elections. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about what that is and why I think that's the case. Um, and those people that do write about Putin's public support often mention, well, this is just nationalist appeal, or maybe it's the economy that's done better. And I actually think it's much broader than all of these things. Um, uh, but also in a way that's, uh, that, that creates some fragility for the regime. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and um, I think the, maybe I'll address at the end a little bit about the uh, sanctions that the United States had imposed on Russia after Crimea, the economic sanctions, uh, which have caused some economic hardship in Russia um, related to other international factors that have hurt Russia's economy. Um, and surprisingly, these haven't really done much to dampen Putin's uh, support. Um, so I'll talk a bit about why that's the case. Um, so uh, moving forward, um, why would public opinion matter in a non-democratic regime? Well, uh, as Dan mentioned, I wrote a whole sort of uh, you know, four or 500 page book on how these kind of political systems work. So I'll kind of boil this down as best I can now, but again, I'll be happy to elaborate. Um, but I think basically the idea is that you can understand um, politics in a country like Russia um, and the political system not so much as just sort of a system where there's one guy at the top and he gives orders and everybody else obeys. Treating these individuals as just sort of automatons who just take orders and implement them mindlessly. Um, in fact, what the political system is, is it's a kind of conglomeration of these extended power, political, economic networks that all have their economic and political interests. Um, and they're kind of rival to each other. Um, but the one thing that they tend to agree on is that they have to um, respect Putin's authority as kind of the final arbiter and somebody who can, um, you know, whose, whose word matters. And so the art of being a leader in a country like Russia um, is, in fact, to find ways to coordinate these different competing interests within the government. And by competing interests, I don't just mean kind of formal lobby groups or things like that. You know, these are um, entities like, um, you know, basically what I, what I would call kind of extended networks of actual acquaintance whereby um, they kind of have pe their own people in different institutions. So they'll have some representatives in the state, some in the business world, some in parliament. Um, and uh, so they, they, they cut across the, con and, and they often have representatives in multiple parties at the same time. So it doesn't boil down to just party competition either. Um, and so it's kind of shadowy and behind the scenes, but they do exist and I think you can pinpoint them in research um, and some other things I've tried to do that. You know, you can map out these networks and kind of who the leaders are and the internal, you know, the people involved in Russian politics know who the main players are and know what these networks are and know who's representing whom uh, for the most part. And so the art is really to kind of find a role for everybody in the system to keep conflicts from getting out of control and above all to um, create the impression on the part of Putin on top of the, of the leader that the leader is here to stay. Because the instant people start thinking that, well, the leader may be on his or her way out, um, suddenly these rivalries within the system start to come out because the networks in the system start jockeying for position because they have to start thinking ahead. Okay, well, who's gonna be leader after this guy leaves? And so um, since only one network uh, can really be the leader or kind of have the leadership position, um, this could be a very fragile um, uh, type of situation. So, you know, it boils down to the, 
the logic of just succession. Succession crises are often the bane of authoritarian uh, regimes. Um, and so I think this comes out like empirically, what we see in looking at, um, if you look at all the ousters of leaders in the former Soviet world after 1991, setting aside um, the more democratic ones, which, you know, including the, the Baltic countries that have joined the European Union, um, the vast majority of these ousters have taken place, uh, like the colored revolutions, uh, orange revolution in Ukraine, rose revolution in Georgia, when the leader was somehow already a lame duck, was already expected to be outgoing uh, for one reason or other. In their constitutionally final term, they chose not to run for re-election and tried to install a successor. Um, they were ill or getting very old. Um, and that's when these regimes tend to fall. And most importantly of all, who were the challengers that wound up defeating um, the incumbent teams? Um, in almost every case, these were former allies of the regime that had broken with it, anticipating some kind of succession, um, and trying to rally democratic support uh, in their bid to, to try and take over power. So um, you know, this hasn't happened in Russia, uh, but I'll come to Russia and why it hasn't happened in a minute. Um, but uh, you know, if we look at uh, you know, cases like Georgia, uh, even, where um, the, the regime of Edward Shevardnadze fell in 2003 in the Rose Revolution, um, uh, uh, one Mikhail Saakashvili, sort of a, a you know, reputed pro-democracy activist, uh, wound up taking power. But he had been justice minister in Shevardnadze's own regime not long before that. Um, when Leonid Kuchma's regime fell in Ukraine, um, trying to install Viktor Yanukovych in 2004, and the Orange Revolution prevented it. Um, Viktor Yushchenko took power, but Yushchenko had been Kuchma's own prime minister just a few years before. Um, so this is a, a pattern, and I think that's uh, one thing that these leaders have in mind, is that the greatest threat to their power is not always so much just mass mobilization that's autonomous, but the, what really threatens them is when their own allies break with their regime and their own authority starts to crumble. Um, and especially when their own allies start to try and mobilize this public support. And so in this light, we can see what public support does. Um, it deters this kind of defection, because if the people in the system, your sort of uh, unreliable allies uh, who are supporting you, um, think, well, Putin is so popular that even if we had a free and fair election, in all likelihood he would win, this deters you from, it just, it, it makes it less likely for you to think that, well, if I break with the regime and try to mobilize popular support in the name of democracy, that I'm going to win. Because even if you have democracy, maybe Putin will actually win. So it has this kind of deterrent effect. Um, it makes it easier for the regime to mobilize support. In the case of Putin, they often pay people or kind of, you know, use administrative pressures to bring people out into the streets. But it's easier to do if people actually do support the regime. Uh, and the same thing, it makes opposition rallies harder to, um, uh, to, to, to orchestrate in any kind of large way. Um, and it also minimizes the need for outright fraud in elections. So if you have genuine popular support, um, you, know, you can mobilize the machinery of the state, um, but it's less likely that you're going to have to just outright doctor the books. Um, there might be other reasons you would do it, and in fact, I think one reason that um, regimes like Russia leaders will falsify elections, even if they don't really need to, <laughs> is uh, in part just to demonstrate that they can, as a, again, a kind of deterrent to say, look, you know, even if you were able to get popular support, um, you're not going to be able to uh, win, because we have all this machinery uh, at our backs. Um, so in fact, there is one uh, Russian uh, analyst uh, who uh, coined, uh, as far as I know, this term uh, for what regime type Russia is. Uh, so, uh, you know, he argued that, well, it's not really democracy, it's not autocracy, it's a ratingocracy. And the reference there is to ratings, Putin's uh, public approval ratings. And so the argument is, and I think this is, uh, you know, uh, an ob accurate observation, is that uh, Putin and his regime pay immense, like, intense attention to his standing in the public. So uh, basically they're paying a lot of attention to um, how popular Putin is, they avoid actions that seem to be starting to spark opposition. So this is not a regime that just runs roughshod over its uh, population. Um, so you know, just one example, in 2004, they started a certain market reform, which was meant to um, replace state-subsidized things like transportation or certain kinds of privileges for um, older people, uh, among others. 
and replace them with payments of cash benefits. And so the idea was then the market would take over the provision of these services. Um, all of a sudden, in uh, early 20, uh, 2005, uh, you had this massive, uh, just spontaneous um, eruptions of protests among older people in particular um, all across the country. And so they quickly scaled back those reforms um, to something that was much more moderate. Um, so they do pay a lot of attention to public opinion. And so um, I think this is really a key to um, the stability of Russia's regime. And I think kind of looking um, over the whole scope of how things have worked uh, in Russia, um, we saw that Yeltsin was constantly embattled after having lost public support um, after initiating reforms in the 1990s trying to end the communist system, um, and they didn't really have anything in place of it that uh, could kind of generate economic growth, so you had a massive depression. Um, and so he was constantly struggling with uh, different political actors. Uh, but then Putin came and had, right from the beginning, very high levels of public support. And so I think that's enabled him to help fend off the challenges. That combined with his skill in... Um, kind of preventing ma major problems from erupting in relations among these power networks, uh, and of course the uh, you know, rather ruthless application of force to uh, sort of drive home um, the, that he's the man in charge. Um, so how did you get from Yeltsin to Putin? Um, this kind of gets us to the uh, um, you know, question of the sources of, of, of Putin's popularity. Well, Yeltsin was very unpopular uh, at the end of the 1990s. He was facing constitutional term limits. He was um, unhealthy. He had had like multiple heart attacks, um, some of which were not released to the public uh, for strategic reasons at different points in time until later. Um, and in uh, August of 1999, um, it was clear Yeltsin was leaving office, and so he announced that Vladimir Putin would be his uh, successor. And Vladimir Putin at that time was a political unknown. Um, he had been kind of a mid-level bureaucrat, um, was raised up uh, very quickly to be, first of all, the director of the FSB, which is the former KGB or secret police. Um, and so Yeltsin made him prime minister in August of 1999, um, with elections being scheduled, first of all, parliamentary elections in December of that same year, um, which were seen as kind of a test of strength for the presidential elections and then presidential elections in, um, in, in 2000 that were scheduled. Um, and so initially when Yeltsin endorsed Putin, this was seen as the kiss of political death. People thought, you know, this, this completely unpopular guy is endorsing this unknown. It's just going to kill this guy's career. Um, Putin didn't initially appear to be particularly charismatic. Um, but uh, what happened after Putin was prime minister? Um, in September of 1999, we saw uh, a, uh, a series of bombings of ordinary apartment buildings. And so these were just absolutely uh, heinous uh, terrorist acts that were, like, they detonated in particular, the most impactful uh, explosions were um, in the middle of the night in uh, Moscow, so designed to get people when they were sleeping, and just uh, blew up, um, you know, two residential buildings, you know, killing pretty much everybody inside. Um, and so this just struck fear all across Russia. Um, and if you've traveled to Russia and you've seen how all these apartment buildings kind of look alike um, because they were all built you know, during the communist period according to certain kind of cookie cutter styles, um, you know, this, it seemed these destroyed buildings, they seemed just like the kind of buildings that your ordinary Russian uh, uh, you know, lived in. And uh, I happened to be there at the time and uh, I can say that, this, you know, that the feeling that I had there was as close as I felt to what we felt here in the United States to 9-11. And so this was like a real moment of national trauma. Um, again, it's a mystery exactly what happened, uh, you know, how these explosions, like who did it? Um, I don't think it's been satisfactorily resolved uh, either way. Some people have linked um, Putin to this, um, but I don't think that's resolved. Um, but what Putin did then afterwards was to order a, uh, basically he pointed the finger at uh, this renegade Islamic region, traditionally Islamic region of Chechnya, and um, said, okay, well, we're moving in, and um, basically ordered the troops in to uh, take over Chechnya uh, again and to kind of reestablish federal control, declare the existing authorities there, which he had, or which Yeltsin had reached an agreement with earlier in the 1990s, declared them illegitimate. Um, and Putin's popularity ratings, as you can see, went way up. And so these are the uh, percentage of, percentages of people um, at each, uh, of, during each month that said that they would vote for Putin if the election were held today. And so it went up from 4% in September to um, about 20% in October. And already by December, um, it was up to over 50% that said that they would vote for 
um, Putin if, if the election were held that day for the presidency. And so the interesting thing is that before this happened, um, the betting money was not on Putin or the Kremlin to win that election. There was a, 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 the communists were fairly strong, but most importantly, there was a, a conglomeration of uh, you know, former Yeltsin allies, these kind of oligarchic big business people, the mayor of Moscow, former prime minister of Yeltsin, um, who were challenging for the authority and so uh, for, for power, and, and uh, a lot of the betting money was on the, uh, them winning. Um, but as soon as Putin's popularity went up, um, a lot of these people in that coalition started to defect over to the Kremlin side, realizing that, okay, well, it looks like Putin is going to win. Um, we better make our peace with this new um, regime. And so the, the opposition kind of crumbled. And so I think this illustrates the role of public opinion in this system at the same time that it, it demonstrates what the source of it was. Um, and again, one can have different interpretations about what exactly it was about Putin that um, generated this initial support. It's sometimes been said, well, this was a, a nationalism, a xenophobic nationalism directed against the uh, Islamic population of, of Chechnya. Um, uh, but I actually think that if you look at the poll numbers, it suggests it was much more just about people wanting uh, a strong leader. Uh, because Yeltsin, as you may know, if you've read about Yeltsin, um, you know, again, he was sick. There were times like in the late 1990s, just before then, that uh, there were reports he was only able to work about three hours a day. He was in and out of various kind of uh, hospitals and resting you know, kind of places to recu recuperate. Um, he was often reported to be drunk. Uh, so there's some like amazing video of him kind of staggering around. And sometimes they say, well, it was his heart medication or something like that. Uh, but people were ready for a change and just wanted someone to act decisively, I think. Um, because if you look at some of the polls um, during this same period, um, you know, it wasn't clear that people just wanted a militarized reaction to Chechnya. Um, like there was at least one poll taken by the most reliable polling agency in uh, September that, that found that um, as many as two-thirds of Russians would have been happy with this region of Chechnya seceding from Russia, just to get rid of the conflict and just get rid of this, uh, this tension within the country. Um, and other polls showed that basically they would have supported Putin even if he had called for negotiations instead of an aggressive response. So they just wanted, I think, some strong leadership. And I think this is really partly the key to what has um, held him in power, is a strong uh, appeal of his kind of personal leadership style, someone who's seen as, as tough, um, decisive, um, you know, not overly self-aggrandizing, compared with you know, Yeltsin, who was a famous drinker. Um, you know, Putin was more or less abstinent as, as far as drinking. Uh, goes, um, you know, a I don't know if he's entirely a teetotaler, he'll like take a sip of champagne, but uh, definitely you'd never see him drunk, um, unlike Yeltsin. Um, but after 1999, uh, Putin diversified his sources of support. Um, and so one of the things that he benefited from was the uh, booming economy. Uh, and here he benefited in particular from the rise in world oil prices. Uh, and Russia is a major oil exporter. Uh, and so uh, during the 1990s, the prices were pretty low, so Yeltsin um, you know, didn't have a lot to work with. But um, during the 2000s, this was a major source of income for Russia, um, and it in fact did translate into improved lives for people. I mean, I've traveled a lot around to a lot of different regions in Russia, not just Moscow, you know, out further east, and have known people for a long time. And you can see the improvement um, you know, in these people's lives over the course of these years, including you know, development in these smaller um, cities. Um, you know, maybe in the, in the very most rural villages, things didn't improve too much. But even there, you started to get you know, gas lines connected that weren't there before and you know, certain improvements. So people did, I think, start to reward him for that. And there's some uh, you know, well-known uh, among political scientists research by uh, Dan Treisman, um, who has shown how um, Putin's approval ratings during the 2000s track very closely to um, the, the patterns in the development of Russia's economy. Um, so there's a close relationship there. Um, some of the other survey research that I've done and others have done have found that Putin uh, wins support for being seen as a relatively right-wing politician. Um, sometimes people say that he's not associated with any particular ideas, but I don't think that's true. This is something that's been consistent ever since, uh, you know, at least, at least the year 2000. Um, and he's seen as someone who opposes a return to socialism. So he's not seen as a communist at all. Um, and he's seen as someone who wants to move forward with market reforms. Um, Interestingly enough, in the Russian context, he actually tends to be seen as relatively less anti-Western. Um, 
And uh, the way that, uh, so like if you ask people the question, um, how should Russia treat the West? I mean, first of all, I should say, if you, if you ask people, um, you know, how is the West treating Russia uh, as an enemy, you know, as a, as a rival, as an as a ally or a friend, um, a lot of people will say, well, the West is treating Russia, you know, as an enemy or a rival. But if you ask people the policy question, how should Russia be treating the West, um, the vast majority uh, have always responded, um, you know, either as, you know, primarily the plurality response is, is almost always as an ally or partner. You know, you can use both of those terms and you get the same basic result. Not many say a friend. Um, so they kind of want cautiously positive relations with the United States, I think. Um, and that's been very consistent. And that's also the position that they associate with Putin. So if you ask them what position on this problem does Putin take, that's what they do. Um, and uh, we have to keep in mind also the context in which Putin operates, because the alternative parties that exist um, are mostly more nationalist than Putin. So you have the extreme nationalist Vladimir Zhirinovsky, which is one of the four major parties that's been in parliament consistently. Um, and so, you know, this is a very strong kind of uh, nationalist party that at times in its symbolism has kind of made implicit claims on Alaska, uh, you know, as traditionally Russian territory. Um, and the Communist Party, which is also, um, you know, for return to socialism, but also much more hostile to the United States. So these are the other parties that have the most support uh, in Russia today. Um, the, there are pro-Western liberals, but they have a very small level of support that's been, uh, you know, it's been pretty low, uh, you know, since the 1990s. Um, so Putin in the Russian context is less kind of anti-Western, I think, than um, a lot of public opinion actually is, and that a lot of the other political forces are. Um, but in general, he, his support also is based on just a general idea that he's a competent politician, he can get things done. Um, you ask about different qualities of leadership that he has, you know, is he a strong leader? You know, people give him very high ratings on that. And, uh, you know, these are things that are coming, you know, even when he was early on in his uh, rule, you know, before he was really clearly seen as a, as a dictator that people might uh, worry about, uh, you know, kind of saying negative things about him. Um, and so, you know, they see him as strong, smart, you know, relatively honest, um, and relatively uh, caring about their uh, fates. Um, and there also are some interesting other uh, trends. He, he tends to get a lot of support among youth and among women, disproportionately. Um, so I'm less sure about exactly what underlies those effects. Um, I think those are interesting areas for uh, future research. Um, now, a major transformation, however, started to occur um, with Crimea. Um, and so um, basically, uh, for those of you who have not uh, kind of uh, read a lot about its history, um, basically, uh, Crimea, the, the Crimean Peninsula uh, is part of Ukraine, still internationally recognized part of Ukraine, um, but has a long historic association with Russia and the Russian Empire. Um, and um, you know, before that, it was with the Ottomans, but uh, um, you know, with, with Russia. Um, but in 1954, uh, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev um, transferred Crimea from the Russian Republic in the USSR to the Ukrainian Republic of the USSR as a kind of gift representing brotherly relations. And at the time, you know, maybe there are some people that disagreed with it, but for the most part, nobody thought this meant much because everybody was still all part of the USSR. Um, but then things started to change. Um, because, uh, you know, I mean, like, I guess at a certain point, uh, I, actually before talking about the change, I should mention that despite all of this, after the Soviet Union collapsed um, and Ukraine became independent, then Crimea started to matter in Russian public opinion. So, you know, public opinion in Russia has shown right from the beginning of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union that uh, a large percentage of Russians see uh, Crimea as Russian territory. And so it's not that they would have endorsed war or anything like that to actually go and get it, but at least there was this idea that, that Crimea was Russian. Um, and probably more people would have said that than would have said Chechnya is Russian, for example. Um, but then you had these protests break out in Ukraine, um, and uh, the protests were oriented towards bringing uh, Ukraine into the European Union and kind of preventing a Russian-backed leader from trying to slow this process down. Um, the result was the ouster of this uh, relatively pro-Russian uh, leader, uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Um, and in response, Russia took Crimea. Uh, and uh, it was relatively um, uh, peaceful in terms of how it was done, but it was clearly a forceful uh, power grab using troops. 
Um, and then the polls showed a, a remarkable surge in public support for Putin. Um, so it kind of went up from its previous uh, baseline, um, which had been flagging a, a bit because of the uh, economic downturn that had started since the uh, global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, and uh, after that, you had a Russian-backed insurgency begin in other parts of Ukraine. Um, and so that war is still going on today in the Donbass region. Um, so I think something like 10,000 people have now been killed in uh, ballpark uh, there, so a really terrible uh, war. Um, the United States, the European Union, then imposed financial sanctions on Russia. Uh, then Russia announced counter sanctions against the West, so banning imports of certain Western goods that had not been barred from going into Russia before. Um, and um, in the winter of 2014, 2015, you saw a big decline in the Russian economy. Um, so it's linked to other things. There, were, um, you know, there was a currency crisis that Russia uh, suffered as well. So it's not clear this is all, the decline is all a result of the uh, sanctions. But um, in any case, the point is that this surge in popularity went way up um, at the same time that, uh, you know, despite all the economic problems. So one of the interesting questions is, you know, what was it about Crimea that um, generated this public support? Um, and in addition, some people have questioned, well, is this surge in support really genuine? Because maybe it's just that people feel afraid now that Russia has become so closed politically. Uh, maybe they feel afraid to express their true uh, opinions uh, on, on things. So uh, we want to find some technique that can help us get at that. Um, so uh, to study this Crimea uh, phenomenon, um, uh, I, I, had, I took advantage of a, uh, a survey uh, that had been conducted in 2012, so a couple years before Crimea, um, right after the Russian presidential elections of 2012. So it was a study designed to um, study public opinion in Russia right after their 2012 um, presidential elections. And so uh, it turns out it was possible to find those same respondents and re-interview them again in 2015, after um, Crimea had been annexed. So the idea was to ask them almost all the same questions uh, to find out kind of what had changed. And it turns out this is a fairly rare opportunity because um, you know, there have been other instances of kind of what political scientists would call rally effects, where um, you know, a leader of a country initiates a war, their popularity surges, um, you know, then eventually goes down. Um, but it's rare that people have the opportunity to interview people both before and after it in order to see, okay, well, where is this bump in support coming from? Um, so uh, we have the opportunity to see um, who rallied around the flag, who rallied around the leader, um, and who did not. And so um, basically this is a representative sample of uh, the, the national population. Um, these studies that re-interview the same people um, multiple times are called panel uh, studies. Uh, so this is a panel, uh, I call this a panel survey. Um, and uh, so one of the first findings, interestingly enough, was that um, the Crimea phenomenon did not completely transform Russian public opinion. In fact, um, a lot of Putin's bases of support were the same kinds of things that um, it had been based on before. So uh, people who thought the economy was performing better uh, were more likely to support Putin. People whose own economic fortunes had been improving were more likely to support Putin. Um, people who had pro-market or right-wing oriented views were also more likely to support Putin than were others. Um, you know, the, the, the effect of anti-Westernism was a little weaker now in the sense that I think kind of my interpretation is sort of uh, you know, the, there was this greater nationalist hysteria, but everybody was um, kind of on the same page for that, right? Like kind of, there was a lot of people that were anti-Western. The media had uh, engaged in, a, in a, a furious anti-Western campaign. So Putin didn't particularly stand out there, but um, he stood out in terms of job performance, estimates of his confidence, competence and um, personality. Um, and women also um, continued to support uh, Putin, um, controlling for other things more than men. Um, but there were some new wrinkles. Um, one is we see that, that Putin pretty much lost a lot of support in Moscow and St. Petersburg. So these are the more kind of global, globally oriented cities where um, political opposition tends to be concentrated and more Western oriented um, outlooks prevail. Um, he started gaining a little more support from Russian Orthodox uh, church adherents, so people who, who said they identified with the Russian Orthodox church. Um, and so you know, that may have to do with uh, 
the connections between Crimea uh, and Russia. You know, Crimea is populated primarily by ethnic Russians, um, and even the Ukrainians that are there um, are still kind of all Russian Orthodox, so it may be uh, associated with that. Um, he started to gain more support from ethnic minorities, interestingly enough. So it's, this was not just a um, reaping of support from uh, kind of the pure, the majority ethnic Russians. Um, but his edge among youth disappeared, and I think this indicates that there were more um, you know, younger people who are more accepting of the international order and supportive of the stability of international boundaries, you know, who had not personally experienced um, the Soviet Union um, that were more, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of were less comfortable with this move uh, in Crimea. Um, so uh, the study finds, it kind of documents what um, other studies had documented just as a starting point that um, uh, Support for Putin did go up strongly between 2012 and 2015. So um, support for uh, people who said that they would vote for Putin if the election were held uh, at that time um, went up from 52% uh, in 2012 to 72% um, after uh, Crimea in 2015. Um, or actually, this, this is the, the number percentage of people that said they did vote for Putin uh, because this was taken just after the presidential election. But this is, uh, if the elections were held today, that's what they would do. Um, Another wording asked people, do you, prefer, do you approve of Putin's performance, his job performance in office? So we can see that also went up from 50% to 71%. So you know, we see this, this bump in popularity of about 20%. Um, and again, this is even a year after Crimea. And so this kind of bump has continued to stay stable. Um, and then finally, we had a measure in there that um, uh, measured the kind of personal attachment to Putin. So the idea was it kind of borrows from some social, social psychology research uh, and the question was worded to capture the idea that um, when uh, you hear uh, Putin being criticized by somebody else, do you feel personally insulted or offended? You know, is this really unpleasant for you? And so the idea is that might reflect some kind of personal attachment to Putin. Um, and it was interesting to me that only 14% kind of felt this strong attachment to Putin before Crimea, but it went, it more than doubled um, afterwards. Um, so uh, well maybe uh, I'll just skip over something. Else. So the question is sort of who are these uh, people that rallied to Putin uh, after the Crimea event? Um, and were they sincere? Um, so the way the study went was um, basically I took a look at the people who did not support Putin in 2012, right? So kind of everyone that already supported Putin in 2012, a drop from the study. So I was interested who among the non-supporters were motivated to switch over to supporting Putin um, by 2015, kind of after Crimea, um, and what types of people were these. So I used a, a logit regression analysis, which is a statistical technique designed to identify correlations in the data. Um, and uh, I report the figures as uh, total effects, which are basically, and I'll walk through some examples here, um, you know, what this basically would be would be, say, if um, one went from being uh, male to female, um, how much difference would that make in your probability of um, having become a Putin supporter after Crimea? Um, and include a bunch of control variables um, appropriately. So I won't go into that. If anyone's interested in, in the details of all this, the study, I can explain this table. Um, uh, all right. So um, I'm going to just, I, I'm not going to ask people to kind of uh, go through all the details of these responses. But um, what I will say about this is that I looked at um, kind of who, you know, what were the predictors of rallying in terms of voting, going from not having voted for Putin in 2012 to saying they would vote for him in 2015. Um, the predictors of going from non-support, you know, non-approval of his job performance to approving his job performance and going from not being attached to him to being attached to him. And so these bars represent total effects that were significant. So basically, the top one shows that if you um, were a Russian and you were engaged in Facebook, right? if you, if you used Facebook social media, um, you actually became 11% more likely to rally around Putin um, than, uh, you know, than were non-Facebook users. Um, and so, uh, you know, the point being that there's a bunch of different factors that come up significant for voting, and then a somewhat different set for approval, and then a somewhat different set for attachment. 
Um, so, you know, there are a lot of nuances here that I think are kind of, I mean, they're even beyond what I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interested in going into. But what we're interested in, I think, the most robust factors that predict it are ones that predict changes in all three forms of rallying, right? That uh, make someone go from not having voted to Putin for wanting to vote, him to, to vote for Putin, from not approving of his job performance to approving, and to not being attached to uh, being attached to him personally. Um, so we can put all these graphs together and we get something like this. Um, and so what were these factors that kind of were robust predictors of rallying around the flag, rallying around Putin um, because of Crimea? Um, well, one is the frequency with which one watches TV news. So basically, people that were watching the television news in Russia um, were much more likely to um, move from non-support to support because of Crimea. Um, and so I think this just reinforces kind of one of the things that we know about Russia, which is um, it has very heavily state-controlled media um, that carefully controls the message. And um, you know, it, it would put out a very, very different narrative on what happened in Crimea, what Crimea was about, whether it was justified, um, than did uh, most other media in the world. Um, and, but you know, the narrative was reasonably uh, compelling, right? I mean, they're very good spinners of narratives. So you know, the idea was, well, basically a, a fascist regime had taken power in, uh, crime, in Ukraine in that 2014 revolution. Um, and this plays on certain stereotypes in Russia about Ukrainians as harboring Nazi sympathies uh, during World War II, plays into Russia's own, um, the importance of World War II in Russia's own historical imagery as a big source of legitimacy uh, that, that Putin has tapped into for the Russian state. Um, and uh, you know, these were the kind, and, and so basically the argument was, well, Crimea was just rescuing Russians from, um, and in some cases in television media, they would actually talk about this as such, as re rescuing Russians from potential genocide being committed by Ukrainians. And so these are things that would just seem sort of crazy to people coming from outside Russia's media space. Um, but the vast majority of Russians still rely on television for their n news information, and that's their primary source of information. Internet is creeping up, um, but still, you know, by this time, you know, we're only talking maybe 20% of the people relied on the internet. Um, and actually, we didn't see consistent ref um, effects for people that relied primarily on the internet. So what we kind of see is that the people that were really absorbed into Russia's state media narrative uh, were buying it. Uh, and so um, that's an important uh, the factor. Um, we also see that it, it does seem to be associated with um, pride in Russia. So um, people who believed uh, in 2015 that um, under Putin, for during all the years Putin had been in power, um, pride, you know, one's own pride and, and general pride in being a citizen of Russia had gone up, these people were much more likely to give Putin additional support and credit for um, Crimea. Um, so it does seem to be that this was, Crimea was linked to a sense of prestige on the national market, on the national uh, arena. Um, and so just a, a source of pride. Um, and then um, I think what's most, the most interesting um, finding, uh, and not entirely unexpected from a theoretical standpoint, but um, nothing that I've seen discussed really elsewhere, is that in some ways, the strongest predictor and the most robust predictor of whether somebody rallied around Putin after Crimea, like a non, went from non-supporter to supporter, is whether they thought a majority of other people were rallying around Putin. So it seems that people um, were thinking a lot about what were other people doing in deciding what they were willing to express uh, that they themselves were doing. Um, so uh, basically, you know, so people that thought a majority of other people backed Putin in 2015 were much more likely to go from a position of non-support to support after uh, Crimea. Um, so this starts to raise some interesting questions. You know, are these ralliers really sincere in rallying around Putin, or are they just saying what they think the majority want to hear? Um, because if you think about how polls work um, in any environment, right? A stranger turns up on your doorstep or calls you on the phone. In Russia, it's always someone turning, well, the, the, the better polls are the ones that, like this one, where you actually show up on someone's doorstep. An interviewer shows up at the doorstep, starts asking you all these questions. You don't know this person. 
Um, are you really going to reveal to them what you really think? Um, so um, this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon um, because uh, it, it indicates that, well, maybe people are not being entirely sincere because um, let's just take this figure here. Um, if you remember before, from the earlier survey, this was the, the, the uh, percentage of people who in 2012 told us they had voted for Putin in that 2012 election. In 2015, we also asked them about that same 2012 election. How did you vote? 72% were now claiming that they had voted for Putin in that election. So something doesn't seem to add up. Um, so, of course, we don't know exactly why. Maybe is this people just aren't really remembering how they voted and maybe just think, well, may, I must have voted for Putin. Um, or are they actually, um, you know, dissembling, sort of somehow um, hiding what they really did uh, from interviewers? Um, so there's a statistical technique, or an experimental technique that was used in the survey um, that basically helps us confirm that this was not, in fact, poor Recall. This wasn't just misremembering. Um, and so basically what this technique is designed, it's a list experiment technique, and so it's been used um, in studies of sensitive behaviors and everything from like drug use. And the idea base, you know, to, to um, you know, I, I don't know, different, you know, uh, studies of criminal behavior, that kind of thing. But the idea basically is that you find a way to um, allow people to express that they did something without them ever having to tell you directly that they did it and without the interviewer ever being able to, to identify you as having done this thing or said this thing. And so basically the idea is, um, in, the, in this particular case, um, you have a whole survey sample, right? Nationally representative sample. Um, everybody got a question of the sort, okay, here's a list of activities uh, that you may or may not have done. How many of them did you do? And they're explicitly told, don't tell me which ones you did out of these four out of these lists, just tell me the, the overall aggregate number. And so um, four such activities went to everybody in the sample. And they were just like very innocuous things. Like I read a book in the last week. I mean, I forget what the exact ones were here. Um, you know, I saw a movie, right? You know, things like that that would not be sensitive and you could expect people would be doing um, honestly. But then what you do is you randomly divide the sample in half. So it's just a completely random break in the sample. And one half, you give a fifth item. And that is, um, I voted for Vladimir Putin in the 2012 election. And again, people are asked the same thing, right? You know, just give me the count of the number of things that you did um, uh, and not tell me which one. So all the researcher gets, like all I got was a series of numbers. Um, but because the only difference between the two samples, if they're completely randomly divided, is the addition of this one extra item, voting for Putin, um, the difference in the average number of things that people did um, really could only result from um, this, uh, you know, th this extra item being added to the list. Um, I mean, it could be error, so you have to do some tests to see uh, whether, uh, what, you know, whether it's, 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 it involved error. Uh, but basically, it's a way of estimating the percentage of the vote without anyone actually ever having to tell you um, whether they did it or not. So um, the result was, in fact, that um, Based on this technique, we were able to find that 52% of people indicated through this technique where they didn't actually have to tell anyone directly what they did, 52% of the population had voted for Putin, which, as you remember, is exactly, I mean, almost exactly the, um, the number who had said back in 2012 that that's how they had voted. So this is, I think, interesting indication that, uh, in fact, this was not about people misremembering. This was people who just didn't want to say that they hadn't always supported Putin. And so um, I think the conclusion that one can draw then um, is uh, that uh, for at least a certain percentage of this, this rallying, there's at least some degree of this kind of dissembling. And it turns out um, that uh, you know, the people that misrepresented their past vote um, uh, you know, were a, a large proportion, but not the entire proportion of, um, of these people that rallied around Putin. So, um, actually I should have put this in the slide, but um, it was about 25, there's about 25% of people that 
accurately said they didn't vote for Putin in 2012 when in fact they didn't. Um, but 75% of the people who went from non-support to support after Crimea um, misrepresented their behavior in this way. Um, so a large percentage of the rally involves some kind of, of, of misrepresenting one's uh, behavior. And this doesn't mean that the rallying isn't sincere. One possible explanation is that people came to love Putin so much after Crimea that they just couldn't bear not having supported him before, right? Um, but at least it shows that there's at least some kind of um, dissembling going on, uh, you know, some kind of misrepresentation of one's real attitudes involved in this rally effect. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's an important kind of general, um, uh, you know, kind of human phenomenon, which backs up a lot of, you know, there's a lot of research on, um, you know, different sorts of behaviors where, you know, people look to others to see what is appropriate to believe and what's not appropriate to believe. And so it's not that they're being ordered to do one thing or the other, it's they want to fit in socially. They don't want to create tensions by saying how they really feel to someone. And so I think this is a lot of what's going on in Russia. Um, so it's certainly not the whole thing, because like I say, at least 25% of this bump in Putin's popularity, I think, is pretty clearly genuine, because um, you know, these are people who you know, accurately admitted that they didn't support Putin in 2012, but, but you know, now do. Um, but uh, there's a large part of it that, that seems not to be that. And I think you know, in terms of thinking about regime stability, um, you know, one of the possible implications of this is that, uh, you know, something, you know, it's not just about heartfelt beliefs, but it's about what people think other people think. And so um, what could undermine stability for the regime is not just, um, you know, changing people's hearts and minds, but it's also changing their thoughts about what other people um, believe. And so I think that means that maybe, um, you know, this kind of bump in support for Putin is less robust uh, less a reliable source of support for him than maybe some people uh, have thought. Um, but of course, the regime also has a large um, media, uh, uh, under it, a large set of media under its control, which it can use to create the impression that everybody supports Putin, right? So that's part of what the news is doing. It's not just getting people to buy into the narrative, um, but it's also getting people to believe that other people buy into the narrative. Um, Sort of a group, group think effect? Yeah, I think, I think it is. A, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's much like that. Um, and there are a lot of other phenomena, you know, where it's been identified uh, that it is kind of a, a group think that can emerge and that it, it, it reinforces itself but then can change in kind of a cascading fashion. You know, once one person starts to express dissent, that emboldens other people to start thinking, well, maybe I'll start to express my real views, um, and then the whole thing can uh, unravel. Um, you know, how far the unraveling would go depends on how big the genuine component really is. Um, and so, you know, we still don't know precisely how large the, the degree of genuine support is, um, uh, you know, because maybe, maybe you'd have an unraveling of public support that would stop at 50%. So it still might, the real level of support might be higher. But I think, um, you know, what this research reveals is that there is a pumped up dimension to it. Uh, yeah. Would that also kind of apply to any sort of like form of government with public opinion? That people just don't vote generally for themselves, but they vote with like what their family members or what their friends sort of. Um, yes and no. I mean, I think um, you know the one thing about like in, in democracies where people really do think that the ballot is secret. Um, you know, the, the voting takes place in secret, right, in a booth, and so. Um, that's less likely to be about kind of impression management or fitting in just because, you, you know, unless you think there's some way that people are going to find out how you voted. But what it would affect is what people say to pollsters um, about how they would vote um, or, uh, you know, just general other kinds of public opinion. I mean, there's some very interesting research, um, you know, by uh, Cass Sunstein and uh, Timur Karan, an economist and a law professor. Um, you know, who talk about these, they, they use this technical term of availability cascades, which are kind of these cycles of kind of where something happens and um, a bunch of factors, including media, um, just kind of work together to pump up this idea that everybody supports something, when in fact they really don't, but everybody expresses support because they think everybody else does. Um, and so you get these kind of media frenzies that kind of develop in, in you know, certain public opinion trends, um, but then you can see massive uh, reversals uh, as well. Yeah. 
I'm curious about why you keep using the word regime. Um, well, it's a political system that uh, is reasonably stable, I think. So, well, yeah. regime obviously has an incredibly negative connotation. Why don't you use the word administration, refer to administration, like we do with the Obama administration? Yeah, well, one talks about, in political science, it is more of a neutral term, because you could talk about d democratic regimes, authoritarian regimes. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't have a particular problem with it, but uh, I do use the terms pretty interchangeably, whether it's administration or system. Well, you don't use them interchangeably in your representation here, because you keep using the word regime. So that's the word that you are using. Um, I'm concerned that you've spoken about the Crimea without making any reference as well to the fact that there was a referendum. Now, maybe it's not the fact that people who watch the news in Russia are just being subjected to quote unquote good spinners, as you call them. Uh, today we call it you know, fake news, I suppose. Uh, but um, you know, maybe in fact they saw that there was a procedure, a process, and that they agreed with it. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really talking about, in this particular uh, you know, speech, the attitudes of the Crimeans to this uh, event. I was talking about, like, why Russians support it. But, uh, Obviously, Russians yeah. would have watched the news, and they would have seen, as the rest of us did, that there was a, a referendum. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, you know, kind of if you ask Russians what they believe, they believe that the majority of Crimeans uh, supported the annexation, and, um, you know, probably that's supported in public opinion data. So... Um, you know, certainly there are a lot of things that could, you know, fit into this, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the narrative that they'd be getting from uh, television. So I, by saying a narrative, I don't mean that it's necessarily, you know, based in, uh, you know, untruths. Um, you know, usually they, they're based in some kinds of facts as well uh, that mix both truths and uh, untruths in certain cases. So, yeah, um, but you, when you said they were good spinners, I think that <laughs> says that the narrative is spun, which means that it's... Yeah, yeah. No, spun doesn't mean necessarily fake. You know, spinning would mean emphasizing you know certain things over others. Um, and so, you know, in this particular case, right? You know, I mean, they'd emphasize the you know public support or expressions of public support among certain populations in Crimea, but you know, they would underreport you know certain other expressions of opposition among certain other groups. Um, and uh, you know, they they wouldn't be reporting uh, some things about the Ukrainian regime than they would from others. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, in real reality is complex. So as a social scientist, I'm not looking to, um, you know, kind of evaluate the correctness or incorrectness of any of this here. Um, but, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm focused on what makes, uh, you know, what about this action um, increased public support uh, in, in Russia, uh, you know, for this. And, and, and it is true. The vast majority of Russians feel that this was a legitimate act, that it was historically, um, you know, justified, um, and that it was something that they were doing, rescuing these uh, populations from, uh, you know, the possibility of a genocide or, uh, you know, at least some form of political persecution from uh, fascists. So, you know, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I think that all is compatible with the story that I'm saying. So. Um, Let's see, I guess just um, maybe, uh, I guess the one, one last thing I'd just say is that um, you know, we find that the, the media effects in particular tend to be most strongly correlated with the, um, the kind of, uh, with the uh, set of people, associated with the set of people who are insincere, uh, at least have some component of insincere rallying. Um, and so, you know, I think that's sort of the effect here. Whereas if you look at the people that are clearly sincere in their rallying, um, you know, the main substantive findings, so there's one um, uh, uh, media source that, uh, you know, kind of this social media of contactia that appears to be associated with this genuine rallying, um, but also this, this element of pride that a lot of this has to do with an increase in Russian pride. So the, the pride factor and issues of nationalism, kind of Russia, um, reviving appears to be something that's important in the genuine component of support uh, here. Um, and so, whereas the other things like media and the expectation that many other people think are supportive, um, that is what is, is associated with the more um, uh, kind of the, 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 the at least partly insincere or not fully sincere uh, type of rallying. Um, 
So I guess let me um, leave that here. Um, and so I think like some of the rallying is sincere that's come out from Crimea uh, for the reasons we've discussed. Um, but there's a large uh, component who are kind of saying what they think other people want to hear, kind of trying to fit in. Um, and as we were just discussing, I think this is a phenomenon that's uh, very typical in, in the United States and other places that you can identify a lot of applications to. And so I, I would recommend this uh, Timur Karan and uh, Cass Sunstein uh, article if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, I think nationalism itself, certainly not xenophobic nationalism, um, is not a major source of, of Putin's support surge. And it traditionally has not been a, a huge source of his support more generally, I think. Um, interestingly, the sanctions uh, that the U.S. has imposed and the cost of the Ukraine war, um, they, they're found to kind of weaken the rallying a little bit, but not much. It's completely overwhelmed by the overall support um, for uh, Putin that the Crimea uh, annexation seems to have generated. Um, and so actually, I, I should have eliminated this last uh, line. That last line was from an earlier version of the analysis. But um, all right, let me just uh, open it up more generally for questions now, and I'd be happy to um, discuss this or any of the other um, topics related to Russia or Russian domestic politics that you might want to discuss. So. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have mm -hmm. a question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you read uh, Putin's Valdai speeches, you know, from 2013, 2014, um, they seem to be, they appear to be open to the United States, you know, <coughs> says things like, well, we've been, you know, struggling with the Chechens for uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of years, and, you know, we could talk to the Americans about, you know, terrorism and things like that. Um, why, why is this, and why are these kinds of things seen as dissembling, to use another one of your words? Um, I don't know if it is seen as dissembling. Um, you know, I think certainly now the new administration in the United States sees this as a genuine expression by Putin. So, you know, some people see it as dissembling, other people not. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, my, my sense is that, uh, you know, in the Obama administration, the interpretation was that, uh, you know, this is not, a, uh, you know, a, a leader that we can really work with anymore, um, you know, after the Crimea events and other things, you know, annexing the sovereign territory of another state, you know, that kind of thing. But I think the new administration sees it very differently. Um, so I don't think there is kind of one general interpretation of it. Um, you know, my own sense is that, uh, as re was reported in the survey, that, um, you know, Putin on the whole actually is in favor of, of uh, certain kinds of cooperative relationships with the United States. Um, you know, he just wants to do it on terms that are favorable to Russia. Um, and so I think that's reflected in the, the way that the Russian public sees him that I mentioned, which is that, uh, you know, they see him as someone who is supportive of partnerly or, you know, kind of alliance-related uh, relationships with the United States, which would not mean giving up Russia's interest for the sake of the United States, but would mean, you know, finding some way to, to uh, you know, work, work together with it. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's accurate to say that it's you know, it, it's treated as, as dissembling by everybody. Um, yes? Thanks for your cogent analysis of uh, sources of Putin's uh, support. I just wonder if you could tell me, uh, given your comments earlier that in your Patrol of Politics uh, book, that Putin's, that, that regimes of such type uh, don't really have any to fear the opposition and only allies until they reach a constitutional limit. And Putin's got till 2024. Uh, so he's got some, some time to mm -hmm. deal with this issue. But uh, nevertheless, in the current call up here, or the Security Council, as they call it today, where do you see potential fissures of people that may uh, distance themselves from him? Or do you see any? Well, right now it's really hard to, to say, just because, uh, you know, Putin's, I think kind of the two... Um, I mean, what, you know, when I'm talking about regularities, it doesn't mean that some freak event can't happen. I mean, like the Ukraine Orange Revolution, or the, the Euromaidan Revolution was an exception, because like Yanukovych was not in his final term in office, but he was unpopular. So the key is that, you know, kind of when unpopularity and um, succession come, you know, onto the table, you know, that's when a, uh, a leader becomes particularly vulnerable. And so right now, um, Putin faces neither of those. I mean, he still has, a, you know, tremendous popularity, or at a minimum, the perception uh, by many people that he is popular, which is just as good, uh, at least in the short run. Um, and he doesn't face a constitutional term limit. But I think you're right, you know, as 2024 approaches, I mean, that's many years from now, 
um, you know, that's when you'll start to see the fissures come out. Um, but I think potentially they can come out in all kinds of different lines. You know, the key is just sort of identifying who the power networks are that are, are rivalrous, right? Um, because the key consideration that emerges when a leader um, is seen to be leaving is, okay, um, you know, as a network, what you want to make sure that, you, you know, that you want to make sure that you're not on the losing side of any battle. Um, you want to get power if you can for yourself, uh, but if you can't, um, you want to identify who the winner is. Um, but most important of all, you want to make sure that any, like a real rival network doesn't get power themselves, because then they're going to come after you and try to get your resources. And so, um, you know, I, it's hard at this point to identify exactly, you know, where fissures might uh, uh, arise other than just to, you know, see all the different types of networks that are there. I mean, one of the ones that people kind of um, stereotypically talk about as well, you have these sort of, uh, you know, Western liberals that kind of come out of St. Petersburg and you know, have a more Western-oriented approach, uh, you know, versus the Siliviki, uh, right, the kind of people with old, uh, you know, KGB ties. Uh, but there are divisions within the former, uh, you know, KGB group as well. Um, so it's not clear that they would all act in concert and, um, you know, all kinds of tactical alliances are, are possible. Um, but again, I think for that really to come out, you know, you would need not only the succession to start coming, but also, um, uh, you know, some weakening in, in popularity of, of the leader. Because if, the, if someone like Putin remains, like, highly popular, he's in a strong position to kind of guide his successor into office. I mean, so I think that's what happened, for example, in 2008, which was, uh, you know, Putin was just riding so high in the ratings, it was clear that most people would have just followed his advice and voted for whoever he endorsed. Um, so um, he was able to make sure that when he stepped aside to be prime minister for uh, a while, um, that uh, you know his protege Dmitry Medvedev was the one elected president, and so you know he avoided the, these kind of uh, uh, fissures. Yeah. Do you think that this summer's changes with Ivanov being demoted and perhaps uh, Solotov coming into the Security Council that didn't signal anything? That uh, well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, think uh, I guess I wouldn't say that it, I, I don't think it reflects any immediate kinds of concerns. My sense is that that reflects just more of a kind of tactical adjustment um, that the system makes uh, constantly. I mean, this is a, a regime that's been kind of constantly dynamic in terms of changing, right? It's not, you know, it, it, it's constantly adjusting. And one of the adjustments it needs to make if it has a, a long-term perspective is, you know, bringing in younger cadres, you know, younger people in, promo pe in positions of power, you know, especially as Putin himself gets older. Um, you know, my guess is kind of, the, you know, this creation of this National Guard, um, you know, is part of just reshuffling things. So that's the other thing you want to do is kind of, you know, keep entrenched interests from, um, you know, getting too entrenched. So, um, you know, there is a certain reshuffling uh, that occurs. And, you know, my guess is, if anything, the Presidential Guard may have to do with sort of uh, trying to stave off potential coups or something like that, should somebody get that idea uh, in the longer run. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's very hard to say at this point, just because I think, you know, politics can be very fluid, um, and it's pretty early in the game for this. But, you know, I, I do think they think long term. So, uh, yes. Um, um. President Trump has uh, expressed some admiration and support for Putin. I think one time called him a really good negotiator. Uh, what impact, if you can speak to uh, this, does that have on Putin's um, reputation or influence among his fellow Russians? Do they do they view that favorably or not? That that's my. Sorry, the, just so so. What are Trump statements viewed positively in Russia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. What impact is, mm -hmm. has, does that have on? Um, yeah. On <coughs> and the other thing about um, um, is whether how do the Russian people feel about uh, the belief among many in the United States that Russia hacked our election? If you could address that. Yeah, um, I mean, I should say I haven't seen systematic opinion research on these things. So, um, you know, I can, I, but I give you my opinion or my sense. And my sense is that um, uh, Trump's rhetoric favorable to Putin is very positively received in Russia. Uh, that, uh, you know, they see this as an opportunity for um, a restoring of a more normal relationship, which I think, um, you know, your, your average Russian wants. 
Um, I mean, there's a lot of suspicion and hostility to the West, which I think kind of comes out not of not of a native hostility to the West. I mean, they they want to travel in the West. Uh, you know, people send their kids here. Um, uh, you know, they see a lot of commonalities, but they see a threat as well. And I think they see Trump as someone who is more um, recognizing of what they see as Russia's real interests uh, in the world. And so I think a lot of people there, at least from my uh, just kind of anecdotal experiences and, uh, you know, has been that people are pretty uh, positive uh, about that. Um, and remind me, the second question, what was the... Just the, uh, the belief among uh, a large number of people in the United States that Russia hacked our elections by, you know, sending oh. the uh, email, emails, hacking the email yeah. server. And how that's viewed in Russia. And how that's viewed in Russia. I, I think you're, I mean, my, my sense is that at least at the level of kind of experts and, you know, Russian experts who I've talked to, um, a lot of people just don't believe that Russia really did it. Uh, so I think that that's kind of the, the primary view is that, you know, it could have been anyone else. Uh, you know, why would we do that? Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's diversity of opinions and views on these kinds of things as well. I'm sure there's a group that kind of thinks, yeah, we probably did it and it worked. It was great. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, again, this is all kind of speculation. Yeah. Um, I know you didn't really know why, like, there was so much support between youth and women, but do you have a hunch about that? Or well, I think early on, uh, sort of the, you know, the younger set were, um, you know, sort of uh, supportive of Putin's, uh, you know, kind of vigor and vitality. Um, and also, I mean, there's been some research showing that kind of the Russian youth um, also um, you know, like the new assertiveness of Russia that, that Putin has, uh, you know, introduced, uh, you know, because they're not, like, the, a lot of people thought that, well, the new youth, they're just going to be, uh, you know, the rising generation in Russia, post-Soviet generation, they're going to be very Western-oriented. In fact, that hasn't turned out to be really the case. At least, you know, there are Western-oriented youth, but um, there's a large part that, that aren't. Um, and the women, you know, I honestly don't know. I mean, there, you know, there, there's, because there are different kinds of theories, you know, uh, you know, some kind of being pretty simplistic that there's this whole kind of sex appeal idea, which I find a little trivializing, um, but I have seen that out there. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, I mean, you know, there may be, um, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, because if you're thinking about Putin versus alternatives, um, you know, Putin comes off as a more, um, you know, kind of someone who is more respectful of, of, you know, women than presumably people like Vladimir Zhirinovsky, you know, who, you know, so it may be a relative phenomenon, um, but I think it's a great topic for research. It's something that I've wanted to sit and kind of look around the data to see kind of what's driving it. Um, you know, and I've asked a couple experts on gender politics in Russia and didn't get a really good answer either, so I think it's out there to be studied. Uh, yeah, please. Um, would you say that the data supports, like, your average Russian citizen is more concerned with Russia's position as an international power? and how things are going at home, like as long as Russia looks tough and good to the rest of the world, that may be more important to the economics. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, and it's always hard to kind of weigh which factors are more important. But my sense is that your kind of average Russian citizen, like if you look at kind of how they weight relative problems, you know, in polls, uh, you know, they, they are primarily concerned, like what problems they see is like the most critical facing Russia. You know, it usually is like the economy, corruption, things like that. I mean, but at that same time, you know, in that same breath, um, they do like the kind of what they see as the rise in the prestige in Russia and the pride. And I think one difference may be, and one kind of factor behind this may be, um, is that, um, you know, I think Russians, like, are opposed to corruption, obviously. Um, they want a better economy. Um, but they're also kind of pessimistic about what can realistically be done. So even though Putin has these sky-high ratings, um, if you also ask people, well, under Putin's, air, you, know, uh, you know, under, under Putin's uh, term, right, you know, in office since 2000, you know, have the following things gone up or down, right? Um, and the vast majority say corruption has gone up or stayed the same, right? You know, so it's, it's not that they think he's brought corruption down. Uh, you know, similar things with other kinds of problems. But the one thing that they think he has really done that has really gone up strongly and this is something that, uh, you know, Lev Gudkov of the Levada Center polling agency has pointed out in, in presentations that I've seen as well, um, you know, is this pride in Russia and Russia's influence in the world. And so I think they do see that as something that, you know, not only that they value, but that a leader can realistically do. And so I think that's one reason why it, it, it tends to matter in public opinion. Um, you know, even though they care more about the economy and they don't see the economy as, uh, you know, as good as they would like. Um, but I think they just don't, there's a limit to what they expect the leaders to be able to do. And I think Putin is doing as good a job, I think, as anyone else or, you know, better than anyone else 
out there could realistically do. Um, so I don't know. Are we? One, maybe one we can, last question. Okay. All right. Yes, Alicia. At the beginning of your talk, um, you said that um, Russia cannot be described as a democracy, but it's not a dictatorship either. So can you please tell us, in your opinion, then, what kind of political regime is Putin's regime? I mean, I've used the term hybrid regime, um, which is a very vague term, I know, um, but partly because I don't have a better one. Um, and I think for me, what the threshold is uh, between, uh, you know, I'd say like a democracy is where, you know, you have regular free and fair elections in which the majority of people are able to compete. Uh, you know, so Russia's clearly not that. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I think a dictatorship is where, you know, you definitely, you, 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 where opposition, real opposition forces are not allowed to compete at all. Whereas that's never been the case in Russia. You've always had on the presidential ballots and the parliamentary ballots, the Communist Party, you know, which I interpret as a real opposition. Um, usually there's some liberal opposition, the Yablika Party, you know, which I think is a real liberal opposition. And so um, the playing field is tilted dramatically against them, right? They have a hard time getting media coverage. The news um, you know, is, is very much slanted towards the interpretations favoring the dominant authorities. But they're able, they're out there to get to compete. They do get some television airtime in the form of commercials. Um, and I think that's a big difference. And, and there is a certain level of, of freedom at the individual level, um, which is a big difference from countries like Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, where, um, you know, you, you don't see any of those parties on the ballot, you know, even expressing those kind of views in public, um, you know, risks putting you in jail. Um, so, so I, for lack of a better term, um, I use uh, a hybrid regime. Um, but a lot of my work, like in my book, uh, Patronal Politics, part of that is trying to create a whole different language, right? So in that book, I don't really talk about regime at all, to come back to that. I just, I talk about systems. I talk about single pyramid systems and competing pyramid systems, which have to do how these networks are arranged at different points in time. And I think they capture some of the dynamism of these political systems. Um, but that's a whole different logic that uh, wasn't the subject of this particular talk. Um, so I do think the language is problematic. But you know, when using these terms, I would say you know, that, that's where I kind of distinguish between a democratic regime, a hybrid regime, and an authoritarian regime. So, all right.